Thank you, Miss Naomi. Thank you, Brother Don. Love Christ honoring music. Junior Church, are you ready to go? Okay, everybody line up, please. Miss Nakota will stand at the door and everybody line up behind her. Ladies go first. Ladies first, and then the gentlemen will line up behind the ladies. Everybody be polite, be helpful. Remember the rules. We have one rule, right? Hey, James, what's the rule? Very simple, isn't it? Okay, adults, you better remember that rule too. We'll send you to junior church if you disobey. <laughs> Got it? They'll make you be good. All right. Miss Micah, what you got? Baby. <laughs> he's precious, isn't he? As long as he's not hungry, he's just a happy, pleasant kid. <laughs> All right. We are going to be in the book of 1 Samuel. This morning, in Sunday school, we were in the book of 1 Samuel. Because last Sunday, uh, in Sunday school, we studied the book of 1 Samuel. Today was supposed to have been 2 Samuel for Sunday school. Because we're going through a book of the Bible every Sunday in a survey for um, a Sunday school class. But today in Sunday school, we went... We, we went back into 1 Samuel and looked at one chapter. That was chapter 28, talking about Saul, King Saul, going to the witch of Endor and seeking uh, help from her to know what God was saying to him because God wasn't speaking to him anymore because he backslid so bad. God had cut him off. Well, we're going to also go back to 1 Samuel in the preaching service today, but we're going to go to a very familiar chapter chapter 17 one that deals with a young man named david and a big tall strong fella named no no miss betty miss betty's been out of church so long she doesn't even know no i'm kidding it, it's hard isn't it it's so hard i'm just teasing miss betty what's the big tall fella's name that david fought against goliath so david and goliath I don't know that I've preached a sermon since I've been here just about that text, but I'm going to today. Now, this is Palm Sunday, according to church tradition. This is Palm Sunday, the week before Jesus was, uh, was resurrected from the grave, the Passover week. And according to the church calendar, and I use that word very loosely, <laughs> According to church tradition and calendar, today is Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem and they laid palms, leaves on the street and cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, and, and welcomed Jesus as Messiah. But then they rejected Jesus and put him on the cross a few days later. So usually I would do something about Palm Sunday from the Bible today, but not this time. We're going to look at David and Goliath and the giants that we fight in our lives. God's been working in my heart about this, and I just felt like it was, if he's been working in my heart, then I need to share it with you. So, let me get my Bible, and we will meet there in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I do not have anything on the screen for you, so, but uh, if you keep your Bible in front of you, pay attention, you won't have any trouble following along. The first thing we will do is read the text of 1 Samuel 17. As we need to read what God says, then we can learn something about it. It's quite a lengthy text, but it's very interesting reading. If you read along with me, you won't get bored. If you sit and listen to me read, you might get bored. All right? I can't guarantee you'll be able to stick with me. Because I'm pretty boring. But if you read along with me, you'll be all right. Here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and and Azekah in Ephesdamim. 
And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. May I just add a little comment here? The Bible calls these two places they stood mountains. They're not mountains according to what we would call a mountain, okay? They're more like hills, just a round top hill on either side of the valley. There was, this valley is a very wide valley. The valley, and, and this, this valley is also the valley uh, where the storms come from the Mediterranean Sea over to the Sea of Galilee. The valley of, of um, I've forgotten the name of it. We'll think of it later. It's okay, it doesn't matter. But this valley has several of these round top hills on either side of the valley. But it's a very fertile valley, okay? And a very rich land in this valley. And it's a common place for kings to come with their armies and fight. It's a very normal situation. This is because it gave them the vantage point to see what the other army was doing and they they would form they, it was common place for battles and uh, Israel been defeated here in this valley many times but they've also won well, here we find out that they're fighting against the Philistines verse 4 and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose Height was six cubits and a span. How tall is that? Yeah, a cubit is usually whoever is the ruler at the time would set the length of a cubit from his elbow to the tips of his fingers. Some would say to the beginning of his fingers, depends on who you ask, but around 18 inches, roughly. Okay, depends on how long your arm is and all that. But it's roughly 18 inches, 16, 18, something like that, is a cubit. And he was how many cubits? Six. Six cubits and a span. Okay? So he was about nine foot nine, approximately. Something like that. He was a tall fellow. And he wasn't just tall, he was very muscular. Okay? Let's keep reading. Verse 5, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. Does everybody know what a coat of mail is? Can somebody describe to me a coat of mail? What's it made from? How, how's it made? Some, give me an idea. I mean, there are different types of coats of mail, but what, what would be a, an example of a coat of mail? Can somebody tell me real quick, real loud? A shield. Say again, who said? A shield. A shield? Not exactly, because a shield he would hold, he would hold in front of it. Coat of mail something they wore. Yeah. Like a vest made out of chains. A vest made out of chains. Very simple explanation, but very good. Because the, the, there would be links of some type of material that would resemble a chain, and they would be knit very close together and the, this vest or this coat would cover the main organs of the body, okay? The heart, the lungs, the abdomen would cover that and, and it would hang him over his shoulders and cover him so that when he's, when he, if he gets hit with a sword or, or a spear, it won't kill him. It may hurt him, but it won't kill him, okay? So this coat of mail, we're gonna learn more about it in a minute. The weight of the coat was five, thousand shekels of brass five thousand shekels of brass does anybody have a footnote to of your verse that tells the weight what is that miss betty it says 166 pounds 166 pounds 126 either way you go that is a heavy duty piece of armor just for that part of the body Okay, and verse six, he had greaves of brass upon his legs 
greaves of brass, those pieces of armor that would cover his shins and his thighs, and a target of brass, a circular type of shield, a target of brass between his shoulders, something to shield his back. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. You know what, a, how many knows what a loom is? Okay, that you use to weave cloth, rugs, heavy materials with. Okay, the beam was the heaviest part of the, of the loom or the machine, whatever it would be called. And it was the, like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. The, the head of his spear was about 15 pounds, just the head. Now think about this. And one bearing a shield went before him. All right? This guy was prepared for battle. Goliath meant business. Yes? This shield bearer has to be pretty tall, or he's not protected. Exactly. The, the, shield bearer, the shield bearer was willing to give his life for the one he's trying to protect, but he had to be pretty tall, but he had to be carrying a pretty good sized shield too, didn't he? To protect the one behind him, because he's not protecting himself, he's protecting Goliath. Mm -hmm. and he's standing right in front of Goliath to take the arrows and things like that that might come his way. Okay, verse eight. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? He's mocking them, remember that. Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and what? What's it say? Greatly afraid. Greatly afraid. Saul and all Israel. Okay? Verse 12. Now David, we see David enter the scene. David was the son of the uh, Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for old, I lost my place. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And, verse 13, and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and the next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went, returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, notice that, morning and evening, and presented himself 40 days, 80 times. He's come out and stood out before the armies of Israel and made that same announcement 80 times. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Verse 19, Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So you got the scene is set. You see these two armies and they have battles, okay? They've not had the big war yet, but they're having battles. They'll come around this side and try to, try to, try to sneak around behind the army and they'll get, a, they'll get a fight, a, a war, a little battle over here on this end. 
Then they'll try to sneak over here and try to sneak in this ditch line and they get in a battle down here. Not Neither one of the whole armies, neither army on either side, the whole army at one time has gotten into a big battle yet. Okay? When they, when they finally get fed up and they, they, the, and it was typical of battles in that day, when they would finally get just fed up of these little battles, they would all rush in and somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose that day. And it's going to be finished. But so far, they've been 40 days there, and they've just had what we would call skirmishes, small battles. They're fighting, and they're fighting. They retreat, and they fight, and they retreat. And it just goes on and on. And every day, Goliath comes out in the morning, and in the evening, and he chants, uh, chant, not chants, uh, taunts the army of Israel and says, why, why do you keep trying to fight us? Why don't you just send out somebody to fight against just me? And he makes this deal with them. All right? And nobody takes him up on it. Not one person. And every time he comes out, the whole army gets afraid. And Saul himself trembles in fear because of Goliath. Now, it's a very serious situation. First, Saul has made, he, he's making Saul look like a coward. He's making all of Israel, the armies of Israel, look like cowards. And he's causing, or the result is, that the people of Israel are not trusting God. Neither is Saul. They don't, you know, in previous times when Saul has gone to war against an enemy, what did he do? God, what do I do? He prayed. When, when Saul first became king, he was a righteous king. He was a good king. And he would seek God's guidance and God blessed him and God would help him defeat the enemies of Israel. But Saul had already started straying away from God even this early at this time. And God was starting to teach them a lesson. You need to be trusting the God, Jehovah of the Jews. And every now and then God would let the enemy defeat them and thousands would die because of their disobedience to God. And this went over and over and over. They get right with God, God would bless them. They get away from God, and God would judge them. And it's over and back and forth, back and forth. All the years that Saul was was king. Now, this situation is when God started introducing David to be the next king. He needed to lift David up before the people and so everybody would know him. He needed to cause him to become popular. He needed to get his face out there in the, in the media, right? He needed to make sure he'd get him on TV and on the evening news so that everybody would know who David was. David's the warrior. And he put him up against Goliath. God sent David there through his father, sent him, listen, do you, I don't know about you folks, but I don't believe there are such things as accidents in a Christian's life. Do you? No. No such thing as an accident. No such thing as a coincidence. God is in control. God is planning. God is working and using every situation, every circumstance, every appointed event in our lives for his purpose. You see, God's in control always. Even in the smallest details of our lives, God is still in control. And he'll use every decision you make, every decision I make, and he, he, he may not make, he, might, he will not force us to make a certain decision, but God already knows what we're going to decide. Because he already knows everything in the future, and he already knows, and he's already planned, he's planned ahead for that situation. Nothing catches God off guard. So God knew Goliath was coming. God knew that the Israelite army would be afraid. God knew that he needed to do something to, to lift David up to become king someday. And God sent David there as a shepherd boy. He's somewhere between, some, say, some people say he was about 16, some people say he was about 20. He's somewhere in that age. He's just a young fellow, all right? He's not that mature, sculptured, bodybuilder, uh, a tough man. No, he's just a young shepherd boy. Not like Leo. Not like, no, he's not like Leo. No, <laughs> he's, he's not like Leo at all. Not, doesn't have all that bodybuilding experience and muscles on him. 
He's just, <laughs> he's just a young fella who's always done his, his whole experience of life has been watching the sheep for his daddy, right? Watching the sheep. He's a shepherd boy. He's never fought in a war. He's never been a soldier. He doesn't have experience like these soldiers do. But God uses him. Let's continue reading. Verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight. Another one of those skirmishes. And shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. He waved his way through those, those campfires and those tents that are in the backside of the camp, not on the front line, but on the backside. He's weaving his way through there. Picture in your mind this young fellow in shepherd's clothing. He doesn't have armor. He doesn't have a spear. He's got a staff. And what else does he carry as a shepherd? What's his weapon? Slingshot. A sling. And a script bag. All right? He's got a little leather pouch that he carries on himself. And he keeps special things in there, whatever you might need. And, he, and he's carrying a sling. All right? A sling, right? Yeah, he may have some small rocks in, in his bag. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's staying ready because he protects his sheep, doesn't he? Yeah, he uh, and he's good at it, too. Yeah, he gets momentum swinging at it. Makes it go like a bullet. You're not, you're not kidding. You're not kidding. Has anybody ever gotten good at a sling that you, that you swing around like that? Has anybody ever really gotten good with one of those as a kid? Okay. I tried one time as a kid to learn to do that. And it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. You've got to release one of the straps so that the pocket of that sling comes open at just at the right moment, don't you? Well, to switch to the wrist, he knows exactly where that drop's going. You're right. And this shepherd boy, David, has been out there with his sheep ever since he was big enough to be out there. And what did he do? He's out there practicing with me. Practicing with that sling. And he, he got good with it. Hey, when, when a bear's coming after your sheep or a wolf or coyotes are coming up, you want to be able to hit those guys right in the head and scare them off, right? You want to be mean business. And David practiced and practiced and practiced. All, his, all these nights of sitting out there watching his sheep, he was practicing with that sling and he got good. God gave him a skill, didn't he? And he helped him develop it and helped him get good with it. And that's what he did. So he came and let's see, he left his carriage in verse 23. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have ye seen, they said to David, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Free means they're no longer bound by taxes. Everybody pay taxes to the king. All right? Hefty taxes, especially when there was a war going on. They would have to pay taxes to finance the military. Well, and the king's house and everything else. And he said, he'll make his house free. His father's house will not pay any taxes anymore the rest of their lives. Well, at least while that king's in, in there anyway. Verse 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, Tell me again. What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? First time in this discussion, we see God mentioned. 
David's the one who brings it up. He said, this is not the army of Israel. This is the army of the living God because Israel is his chosen people. See, David remembers that. And the people answered him, verse 27, after this manner saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And they repeated the same thing. This is the reward that goes to the man who kills Goliath. Verse 28, and Eliab, his elder, eldest brother, heard what he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I think he's, that's a cut down, don't you? He's, he's, he's criticizing this little shepherd boy. Who'd you leave those sheep with, this little shepherd boy? Hmm. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You just came, you just want to see some bloodshed. You just want to see some men fight. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? He said, Don't we have a reason to fight? Isn't there a good reason for us to be here and to defend Israel and defend the name of God? Isn't there a cause? Verse 30, And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. He says, Tell me again, who is it? What are they going to give that guy who kills Goliath? <laughs> he keeps asking about that, doesn't he? When the words were heard, Verse 31, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. Because finally, finally, after 40 days, one man has stepped up and say, I'll fight him. Nobody, evidently, it seems obvious to me, nobody else has been sent up to King Saul to say, he's going to fight Goliath. But finally, after 40 days, one young man says, I'll fight him. Verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Well, he didn't convince Saul too well, did he? David's just a little shepherd boy. Just a young fellow. Probably pretty skinny. He's not muscular. He doesn't have a sword. He knows this young guy doesn't have any experience. Verse 33, and Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and, be a, and he a man of war from his youth. He is an experienced fighter. David, in verse 34, said, and David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Now look carefully. Here's the key. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Once again, he mentions the armies of the living God. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he shall deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. So Saul got to thinking about it probably and said, you know, I can't send this kid out there like that. I better help him. So he got, it, he got his armor out and he said, here, David, verse 38, and Saul armed David with his armor and put on a helmet of brass upon his head. And also he armed him with a coat of mail. You know what the coat of mail was, right? And David girded his sword upon his armor and he had saved to go for he had not proved it. He didn't know how to fight with that stuff. Can you imagine? Remember, David's just a young guy. His face hadn't got found fat and round like us older guys have, <laughs> right? He's still got that skinny, youthful face. That helmet's kind of wobbling around on his head. You know, it doesn't fit real tight. 
that armor, that coat of mail, it kind of hangs loose on him because he's just a skinny kid, right? He's not well formed like we are older men, right? <laughs> he's, he's still got his youthful body like Leo. And he's over, he's, he's got all this stuff on him and put this big sword on his side. And can you just see it kind of sagging off to one side? He's stretched, he's tightening, cinching that belt down as tight as he can get it, trying to get it around that skinny little waist he's got. And he just can't get everything tight enough. And he starts to, he starts to walk off and he's clanging and rattling and it's all wobbling all over him. And he says, I can't fight like this. I've never had all this stuff on before. middle of verse 39 it says and David said unto Saul I cannot go with these for I have not proved them and David put put them off him and he took his staff in his hand his shepherd's staff and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and remember there's a valley now these days today there is not a brook there is not a stream that flows through that valley anymore it's dried up many years ago okay either farming you know and rerouted the water whatever but there is no there's no brook there's no spring there's no water there anymore it's just a dry valley filled with lots and lots and lots of crops all right now he chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And here's the battle. You, everybody knows the story, but isn't it interesting to read over and over? Never gets old, does it? Verse 41. And the Philistine came out and drew near unto David, and the man that bare his shield went before him. <laughs> and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the, the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest out to me with staves? He's carrying his shepherd's stick. He said, You just come out to hit me with a stick? You think I'm some kind of little dog? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Remember, the Philistines worshiped all kind of gods. The Philistines themselves just their tribe of people had hundreds, hundreds of false gods they worshipped. Hundreds. Not dozens, but hundreds. And he's cursing David using the names of his God to curse David with. Thinks a lot of his gods, doesn't he? Hmm. Isn't that sad that people let uh, uh, cursing come out of their mouth? They call themselves Christians and they still curse with their own mouth? And that, that's sad. Shouldn't come out of a Christian's mouth, should it? No. You can expect it from Goliath. He's a pagan. He worships false gods. And verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Now listen carefully to what he says. Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. See, that's the root of the problem right there. Goliath wasn't just fighting against Israel. He was defying God by the power of his gods. And the battle here is to see who is really God. There's a God in Israel, Jehovah, or there's the God of the Philistines. That's the true battle that's going on. These are just instruments of the battle that happen because somebody has to be declared God in this battle. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee. And take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, 
that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly will know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, we back up just a minute. We start again at verse 46. And uh, let's see, we just a minute. Actually, start at verse 45. And you may want to, if you want to mark in your Bible, it's up to you. But I think it's interesting how many times David mentions the Lord. Verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord. You may want to mark the Lord. Okay? But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord... And notice, now listen, in our English Bible, L-O-R-D in all capital letters is the way the translators translated the word Jehovah. They used L-O-R-D with all capital letters. That's the word Jehovah. Jehovah is the God of the Jews. Okay? That was the name they called him by. Now, if you'll notice, every time he says Lord, it's, it's that word, L-O-R-D, in all caps. So, in verse 45, now verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine hand from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. If I count it correctly, it's four times we see the Lord mentioned, right? Jehovah, particularly, specifically, David used the name Jehovah. We'll do all this. Now, verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. What a pretty picture that is. He fell on his face and he wasn't a movie actor who had an air mattress to fall on. No, this was a real fall where he actually slapped the ground with his face. I just think, I just think it's great. Don't you? And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in his hand because what promise did he make? I'm going to take your head from your shoulders, right? Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine. He jumped up on him and he took out his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him with it and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they what? Fled. They fled. Now all the men of Israel get real brave. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sharaim even unto Gath hometown of Goliath <laughs> right back to his hometown and unto Ekron and they, they returned from chasing and they, they went through all the Philistines tents and took all the good stuff and all, and all that stuff now whew, there it's, a, it's quite an interesting story. It's, on, it's the only story like it in the Bible. 
There's no other battle scene described with such detail between just two people. Just two people. The only two who did the fighting. Well, one did the fighting, <laughs> right? The other one just ran up there and then fell down. But God gave great victory that day. And all of a sudden, David went from being the shepherd boy to the hero. And God did that for a purpose, to get him ready to be king and get the people ready to accept him as king and as a leader. Saul didn't like it too well after he became second to David. But I'm going to show you four things real quick and I'm finished. And so just take a few minutes. I want to give you, I want to give you a, a sentence and a reference. And it's up to you to do the reading if you want to learn more, okay? But I want some lessons we can learn about how to defeat giants. Because we're talking about Goliath being a physical, real, literal giant that David had to fight face to face. And he was defying the armies of Israel and, and, and cursing in the names of his God in the face of people who were supposed to be God's children, God's chosen people. They, they had a giant in front of them they couldn't defeat. I have something here that's very special to me. This was made by some of the Engler children several years back. This is my bookmark that I treasure. And I've quoted this several times, okay? It says, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. Now, this is very special to me. It's not a Bible verse. It's not a quote from Scripture. But it's a principle from God's Word that some children made for their preacher that means the world to me. Because there's a truth here that will get you through life if you'll just follow it. When your problems get too big, and listen, can anybody say that any of your problems are too small? If it's, a, if it's something that you call a problem, then it's bigger than you are. You can't defeat it. You can't overcome it. You can't just get through it. And, and men, and the men of this room, no matter how long you ignore it, it doesn't go away. <laughs> right? And no matter how many times we say, it's going to be all right, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right, don't worry about it. No matter, it's still there. You can't just wish it away. You got to meet it face to face. Those are giants in life. And we face them. But the problem is, we don't do like David did. We do like the army did. The army looked at Goliath and saw how big he was. They forgot how big their God is. They forgot to keep their eyes on God. They got their eyes on the problem instead of their God. And instead of remembering how big their God is, they remembered how big their problem is. And their problem became bigger than their God in their, in their life. And they couldn't have victory over it. They couldn't defeat it. You know, you, you may not be facing a nine foot nine uh, military expert who's there to kill you. That may not be your giant in life. I hope it's not. <laughs> if it is, call Steve, okay? <laughs> I, I call for reinforcements, okay? I think that God is invading that. And then soldiers Why, sure, but I believe God would have directed every one of those arrows to miss. Well, if they had, it would have been an insult to Goliath. Because Goliath was, you know, yeah, yeah, I don't need your help, fellas. Leave me alone. You know, don't anybody shoot. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the hero. Yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is that we, we don't remember to keep our eyes on God. We lose focus of what's bigger, our problem or God. And our God is bigger. And our God is great. Our God is there to help us. 
And he's offered, he's given us everything we need. He's given us his word, the Bible, to help us and guide us through life. He's given us his precious spirit to live in every person who's saved, to help us and to guide us through life, to strengthen us, to help us obey him, to help us through every problem. He's given us everything we need to get through life. But we look at the problem and we forget that our God is bigger. Let me give you four things real quick. Number one, remember what God has done for you in the past. Or maybe not for you. Remember what God has done in the past, period. David rehearsed it. 1 Samuel 17 in this chapter we just read. Verses 34 through 37, David told King Saul, hey, when a lion came and a bear came, remember the story? He just re he remembered what God had done for him in the past. That's He remembered that. And that's, that's what he kept his eyes on. He kept his eyes on what God done. Number two, use, use the tools that God's given you at hand. What's God given you? <laughs> I'll re I'm going to rehearse it again. God's given you God's word. All-powerful, living word of God that will instruct you, guide you, and, and help you through life in every situation. God's given it to us. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got several. Everybody's got access to this book right here. But how do we treat it? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read Dr. So-and-so's help book, and I'm gonna ask so-and-so for help, and I'm gonna ask somebody on that wonderful Facebook for help, and I'm gonna <laughs> that was a sarcasm. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna go over here and check somebody else on the internet and see what they say, and, and I'm gonna talk to a friend of mine, and I you know what I, I love, Brother Bert, you'll appreciate this. And all you older folks are going to appreciate it. Young people won't appreciate it, but the older folks are going to appreciate this. I love it when a young person says, I've been asking people what they think I ought to do, but the only people they ask are people their age. They don't go to anybody what older and wiser who've been through a lot. They, they go to ask the young people their own age, thinking they're going to get some real wisdom from somebody who hasn't done any more in life than they have. Isn't that ridiculous? But that's what happens. You, I know you young people don't appreciate that, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Seek wisdom from people who have some wisdom. Wisdom comes from knowledge, and knowledge comes from experience. And, you, and if you, uh, anyway, okay, I'll get off that. All right. Now, use the tools God's giving you. Use God's word. The Holy Spirit's indwelling you if you're a safe, if you're a safe person, and God's there to help you. David used the tools he knew about, didn't he? That armor wasn't what he was used to. He used the, the tools of a shepherd. That's what he was used to. That's what he was trained with. That's what he knew about. Hey, if you study the Bible, that's a tool in your hand, a tool of power, of wisdom that can help you. Use the tools God's given you. You have a pastor and a church that loves you. Use some tools. You have parents and friends and people around you who can help you. God's given you people to instruct you and guide you. Older folks, listen. We, just because we're older doesn't mean we know everything. We still have to learn too, don't we? Amen. Amen. We need to learn. Learn. Use the tools at hand. If you're not sure how to use them, ask for help. Number three, ignore those who discourage you from living for God. Don't listen to those who are going to try to keep you from doing what's right. Down there in verses 28 29, when... Uh, David's own brothers tried to discourage him from obeying God, from trusting God. Well, I don't know why you're here. You're, you got an evil heart. I know why you're here. You just wanted to see somebody fighting. You didn't come to do anything except just to practice that evil intention of your heart. They tried to discourage him, tried to get him to turn around, but he wouldn't go. Number four, expect God to help you with the giant you're facing in life. Some people are facing a giant of money problems. Some people are facing a giant of, of uh, a jealousy in a family. And it doesn't just mean just the husband and wife. And I'm talking about jealousies of, of siblings or, or jealousy of cousins and, or, or whatever it may be, some kind of ill feelings. They're facing giants like that that just discourage them and get them down. I don't know what it may be. I don't know the giants that you face. I know the ones I face. And I face them just like you do. Maybe it's bad health. Maybe there's something wrong with you physically and you're facing it every day and you have to go through it. Hey, it's a giant. It's bigger than you are. But God's 
bigger than it is. Amen? Amen. God will help you. Expect God to help you. When David stood to, before King Saul, he said, the God of Israel will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And when he stood before the giant himself, he said, the God of Israel will deliver you to me today. And I'm going to take your head off because this is the battle God is fighting for me. When you face your problems, remember who your God is. Remember he's bigger than your problems. Remember he will help you. When the children of Israel, this was years before, back in the book of Deuteronomy, when the children of Israel left the wilderness and they were getting ready to cross over into the promised land, God gave Joshua instructions to pass on to the children of Israel. And he said this in chapter 20, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. He says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 2, Deuteronomy 20, verse 2. And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle, and the priests shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts be faint. Fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. Verse 4, listen carefully. And the Lord your God is he that goeth with thee to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Do we have the same promise that God will be with us, fight for us, protect us, live, work through our lives? Does it mean your problems are, you're never going to have problems? No. Does it mean you're never going to face a battle? No. No. But it means when you do face a problem, God will help you through it. God may not take away the problem. God may not allow uh, somebody else to come and fight in your defense and, and get rid of your enemy for you. God may let you face a horrible battle, a terrible situation, a discouraging, sad tragedy. But God promises he will get you through that. He will help you through that. He doesn't take away our problems, but he will help you through it. As long as you keep your eyes on him and keep trusting him and expecting him to bless. Will you stand with me? Father, thank you so much for these dear folks. Thank you for your word, your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to obey you. Help us, Lord, to do what is your will in our lives. Everybody's life is different, and I know that you have a plan for each of us individually, and thank you for that. But help us, Lord, to obey you. To follow the, the, the path you have for each of us individually. That we will be willing to see you work in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me ask you a question. Has God been working in your heart about some kind of sin that you've let get into your life? And it shouldn't be there. You know it. But you just have not been willing to forsake it and get rid of it. You don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't want to offend somebody. You don't, want to, you don't want anybody to know what's going on in your life. Whatever excuse Satan's put in your mind to keep you from doing that, if it's sin, if it's wrong, and you know it shouldn't be in your life, you need to forsake that. You need to ask God for forgiveness and ask God to help you be right with him. And he will. God will do that. Trusting him doesn't just mean that you stand before an enemy, but it means that you get rid of the giant in your heart, in your life that you've allowed to be there first. You can't face external enemies, external battles in life until you first face the, one that's, the ones that are inside. And we all have them. Everybody has them, no exception. So let's make sure we take care of that first. Any sin that's there that shouldn't be in your life, confess it to God, name it to God, ask him for forgiveness. If it involves somebody else, make it right with somebody else too. You can't just keep it secret between you and God if it involves somebody else. If it involves another person, you need to make that, make that confession with them, ask for their forgiveness. Whatever the situation is, you need to correct it best you can. 
Let's do. Let's just do what's right in this life. Amen. Amen. That's why we're Christians. If you're if you're saved, and I'm looking around the room, and I, I, everybody I know so far, everybody in this room that I know for sure is probably saved. Okay. I don't know your hearts, but from the, everybody in this room has given me a testimony of you being saved. If that's true, if you're really saved, then it's we have a responsibility to be right with God with this life. Let's make sure we are. Let's make sure we're not wasting even one day being backslid away from God. Let's just pray together and dismiss the service, but it's time to do business with the Lord. Will you do that in your heart right now? Father, thank you so much for these dear folks. Work in our hearts to obey you, to forsake sin, to repent, to turn from it, asking you for help and strength to do that. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen.